Good evening. My name is Omane Abu and I work for the City of Glendale Water Services Department. Joining me tonight is Joanne Toms, who also works for the City of Glendale Water Services Department, and Kirti Matura, our guest presenter with the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. I would like to welcome everyone to our class finale for the spring, Cacti and Succulents for Desert Gardens. Before diving in, let's go over some webinar logistics. This might be your first time joining us and thanks again for coming. Attendees are muted and the class will be recorded. The recording will be available on the city's water conservation website and YouTube channel in about a week. You can type your questions and comments in the Q&A or chat functions and Joanne and I will read and respond to as many as we can throughout the webinar. The class is scheduled to be an hour and a half long we have about an hour allotted for the presentation and about 30 minutes for questions. We will aim to stay on track as we want to be respectful of your time. If you experience any significant technical difficulties, please contact Joanne Toms via email or phone. Her email is jtoms, T-O-M-S, at glendaleaz.com, or you can call her at 623-930. 3596. After this presentation, we'll follow up with an email that includes a copy of the PowerPoint, resources, recording, and a link to the survey. And if you complete the survey, you'll be entered to win a free gift card from a local nursery. So be sure to fill out that survey. For those who might be new, here is what your current view might resemble. You can play around with the features so you're comfortable. You can click and drag the vertical bar located in between the presenter and the presentation to enlarge or shrink the presentation view. You can also adjust the audio settings in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Feel free to send comments using the chat button or share your questions using the Q&A button. Joanne and I will do our best to answer questions during the presentation as they come in, but we should have enough time for Kirti to answer questions at the end of her presentation. Real quick, I wanted to share a free publication called Landscape Plants for the Arizona Desert. This guide was developed to help residents create an attractive, water-efficient landscape. The plants featured are drought-hardy, they're tolerant of heat and cold, and are adapted to our soil conditions. You can access this and other guides online using the links on the slide, or Glendale residents can request to have a hard copy mailed to you. If you don't live in the city of Glendale, check with your local um, water provider and they might be able to send you a publication in the mail as well. Of course, I wanna promote the Glendale Xeriscape Demonstration Garden. This demonstration garden surrounds the Glendale Main Library and is located at 5959 West Brown Street. This award-winning garden is a living example of the diversity and abundant low water use plants available for planting a lush and inviting garden. There are different areas of the garden, including the cactus garden. The cactus garden is nestled at the north end of the main library's parking lot and contains over 250 different species of cacti and succulents. We hope you'll stop by for a visit and the garden is free and open to the public from dawn to dusk. I am very excited to introduce you to our presenter tonight. Kirti Matura worked at the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix in different capacities for over 17 years. After serving six years as a garden volunteer, she also worked as a horticulturist for Caesar Miser Landscaping and Consulting at Sign Farms. Most currently, she is the program coordinator for the SmartScape training with the University of Arizona's Cooperative Extension and teaches plant materials for the landscape architecture program at ASU School of Design and landscaping and gardening workshops for several municipalities in the Phoenix area. She is involved in various local and national plant organizations and enjoys sharing gardening information in many different formats. Kirti authored the Arizona Low Desert Flower Garden published by Gibbs Smith and contributed to other landscaping and gardening publications, including Desert Landscaping for Beginners published by Arizona Master Gardener Press. Everyone, please welcome Kirti Matura. Thank you so much for joining us, Kirti. Thank you. So welcome everyone. I'm excited to share some information about some 
very, very, very cool plants that uh, I hope will be interesting to you. The, um, oops, going crazy here. Um, so this evening, I wanna share a lot of, um, I think really fascinating and absolutely gorgeous plants with you. And just to start out, um, you know, the titles, cacti and succulents for our desert gardens, uh, but what exactly is a succulent? If you haven't been pondering this question for days, uh, you know, wanna make sure that you're keeping that in mind. To start with, a succulent is a plant that can store moisture within its tissues. We have a range of succulent plants. Some of them are leaf succulents that store moisture within their leaf tissues. Others are stem succulents. And we also have fewer, but still some root succulents. Here are some examples of leaf succulents. Aloes with those thick fleshy leaves definitely fall into this category. These plants will have the ability, if moisture is available in the soil, they will absorb it. It'll be taken in through their root system and they will just kind of plump up and store as much moisture as is available in that soil. And that acts as a reserve later on when the soil starts to dry out. It gives them a little extra buffer so that they don't um, have as much trouble as perhaps our traditional leafy plants. We have various ice plants that are used in our landscapes around here. They are also leaf succulents. Stem succulents are cacti. It's very easy to think of a saguaro as being a stem succulent, but the prickly pears are also stem succulents, the choyas, all of these have modified stem segments that still qualify them as stem succulents. With our saguaro and some of our other um, barrel cacti and plants with that kind of formation, they have that pleated um, stem that the pleats will expand when there's abundant moisture. And as they start to use up that moisture, you'll see those pleats start to um, kind of diminish, they'll get thinner over time. There are some plants that store moisture within their root tissue. And these we would refer to as the root succulents. The Arizona queen of the night that most of the year looks like a dead stem above ground, which by the way, it's also a stem succulent. Below ground though, below the soil surface, as this plant grows and matures and ages, its tuberous root system will get larger and larger and larger, being able to store quite a, quite a big amount of moisture. And also it's a good storage system for nutrients for the plants. So this is kind of an advantage that these succulent plants have to get them through dry periods. Well, if those are succulents, then what's a cactus? Cactus are basically a subgroup of succulents. They have that ability to store moisture within their tissues and also kind of an identifying characteristics, characteristic is that they have what we refer to as aerials. This is a growth point where um, spines, flower buds, new stem segments, um, and even leaves on some of our cacti will emerge. So it's that growth point of the cactus system. When we see these spines on a prickly pear, they are radiating and emerging from the aerials. So you might have very evident spines emerging from an aerial, uh, but not always. In this instance, they have what we refer to as glockids, um, that's found prickly pears and choyas, um, these nasty, very minute um, bristle-like structures that to me are so much more pesky and a nuisance than actual sp spines. Our prickly pears do have for a very brief period of time, fleshy leaves. Newly emerging pads will have these 
conical, um, very succulent leaves that develop at the aerial points. They will drop these as soon as conditions start to dry out after those pads newly develop. Those pads won't have any of these little fleshy, thick, succulent leaves for the remainder of their time on the plant. It's only when a pad is newly developing. Spines can range in shape, stiffness, color, um, you name it. So it can be sometimes an identifying characteristic of some of our cactus plants. And here's another example of a little bishop's cap that doesn't have any spines, but you can see those aerials along the rib here, they're kind of covered with a felty tissue. Why plant succulents, including cacti, in our desert landscapes? Well, probably one of the top reasons is that they're so drought tolerant overall. There are some that need a little bit more moisture. We have cacti here native to our immediate region, such as the saguaro, that would need much less frequent watering than some of the cacti from uh, perhaps Mexico or some of them from South America even. So, um, and that's another thing to, to mention for when you're next playing your cacti and succulent trivial pursuit game is that cacti are um, endemic to the Americas. They won't be found naturally in Africa or Australia. If you find them there, they were introduced at some point in history. The low maintenance associated with cacti and many of the succulents is definitely a bonus point in the scale of great plants for me because I'm pretty lazy when it comes to uh, maintaining my garden plants. And Definitely, they can be just phenomenal specimens or accent plants within our landscapes. They can just be cool um, and beautiful. So I hope that's those are enough reasons for you to think of including some of these plants. This landscape is primarily cacti and succulents. They have a few little accents of um, some perennials, but just with these plants, you can see the range of the texture and the form and also the color that can be derived with the use of these phenomenal plants. Overall, when we look at the needs of cacti and succulents, they do prefer and some of, it some of them demand a well-draining soil. That's definitely something you want to investigate when you're locating these plants within your landscape is make sure that that soil doesn't stay wet for too long of a time after water is applied. That could certainly cause problems and even um, rotting and failure of these plants. You need to do your investigation, do your research. There are some of our succulents that do not want to be in direct sun, uh, really at any time of the year. Others really do need, um, if not, all day sun exposure, they need a good amount. So make sure you're aware of that, those needs so that you can locate them to your best ability within your landscape. It's important to also know how cold hardy these plants are. We're having um, seemingly more frequent freeze episodes here in the valley that um, could affect the health or survival of some of these plants. So another thing for you to find out before you're working, if you're in a really cold area or for that little microclimate within your landscape that gets colder during the winter than other parts of your landscape, take note of that so that you can properly choose and place your plants. Another thing to think of are the nighttime temperatures. For some succulents, they just cannot function if we have several nights where we don't get below 90 degrees, um, it's all the, the method of their um, processing, the um, components necessary for photosynthesis. Water, overall, infrequent watering, 
You wanna make sure that you're watering to a good depth for the majority of our succulents. They have a shallow root system. So if you're applying water a good foot, foot and a half deep into the soil, that generally encourage, encourages a good full root development, but you have to make sure that the water is applied widely enough around the plant to have those roots radiate in all directions, especially when you get into the, the larger scale columnar cacti, you wanna make sure that those roots, just like with our trees, the roots are developing sufficiently far out from the plant to keep it stable in the soil. Overall, fertilizer is not needed by um, these plants. For some of them, maybe applying a light fertilizer application about once a year um, at the start of their growing season would certainly suffice for most of these. Sun exposure. If it's going to be blaring sun all day, every day, no relief in sight, you need to choose plants that will thrive with that situation. Also, you need to just overall assess the light availability within your yard. This will change throughout the cycle of the year, whether you have um, evergreen or deciduous trees, that's a factor. There is, not all shade is created equal. To me, there's a great difference. And in my mind, I think of diff, deep shade as those ficus trees, or one of my favorites is the Texas Ebony. They have such a dense canopy. Very, very little light makes its way to the ground. It's difficult to grow most anything in this situation. So, you know, try to work around that. The best would be, I think, a light shade that is produced by, a good example is a, is a, a um, Palo Verde. You've got that dappled sunlight filtering through, and it's ideal for growing a wide range of plants. Kind of in between a moderate shade, I consider our mesquite trees as providing this shade rating. They're a little bit denser usually than Apollo Verity, but not so dense that it's a challenge to find anything that will grow within that shade. If you don't have the proper amount of shade available um, naturally, there is a columnar cactus here, I believe it was organ pipe. And with the shadow of that during the summer, with the angle of the sun, the shadow of the stems doesn't stay in one place. It will travel through the day and it gives just enough of a break that these plants that do prefer to not be baked by the sun all day, they get enough relief, which is ideal for them. If you don't have that situation, you could use shade cloth. Make sure that you have the proper rating. You need to go to a garden center that sells um, a shade cloth rated at anywhere from 30 to 50 or up to 60%. A lot of the big box garden centers provide shade that is ideal for people and pets, but not for plants. Instead of the plants getting too much direct light, they won't get enough. And if you are gonna use shade cloth, it is best when possible to support it above your plants. There may be a situation that is critical and you need to right away get some shade over a plant, you know, it's okay to temporarily cover the plants directly, but it's better if it's supported above them so that you can have maximum air circulation around them. Some of our plants, such as the saguaro, when they're young, they don't care much for direct sun all day. As they get more mature though, that could change and they could flourish in full sun. In nature, saguaros generally start out with what we refer to as a nurse plant, and these provide all kinds of shelter. One of the main ones being a little bit of filtering of that sunlight so that they're not hit when they're very young, you know, two or three inches old, um, tall, so that they're not just, you know, burnt, <coughs> pardon me, burnt by that sun, but given some relief. 
Okay, there we go. When we work with succulents, they will let you know when they are receiving too much direct sun. We have to you know, be watchful and look for those signs. Initially, the coloring will, will change to a yellow from whatever the normal green is, blue green, dark green, olive green, it will have some yellowing. That's when the plants telling you, yoo-hoo, I need help, give me some shade. If we disregard that, the color changes from yellow to white. And that's an indication of actual sun scald. Once that happens, that is dead tissue there and we can't reverse it. If we just have the yellowing and we give this plant some relief, hopefully it should be able to green back up to its natural, um, natural color. If our succulents aren't receiving enough light, what happens is etiolation sets in. Here's another good word for your trivial pursuit. So etiolation is an indication of insufficient light. Some of our plants, you know, the stems might get kind of spindly, leaves are pale. With our succulents, such as these columnar, Mexican fence point posts, they get pointy heads. Instead of growing straight, um, they have this unnatural tapering. That is due to insufficient light. Um, it's a shame even, you know, these, um, these are different. It's a different species, but they're starting to get skinnier. You can't reverse that. And once it gets this extreme, um, you know, if you put them back out in the proper light, um, and, and the stems start to get wider again, that's just gonna be a weak point. So that's basically a wasted stem. Um, so we want to keep an eye out for those signals that the plants will be giving us. I think some of our succulents have a hidden feature that really pops when they are backlit by the sun in the morning or in the late afternoon. Be aware of this and strategically place them in your landscape so that all of a sudden, boom, at this time of the day, they just come to life with a new dimension. Um, they'll glisten or glow and really um, be a, a very attractive focal point. I had mentioned the tolerance to cold. Some of our succulents, such as this uh, Smooth-leafed agave, very susceptible to freeze damage. When we start getting um, down to 30 or so degrees, you want to make sure that these are protected. This plant has the leaves burnt back. That is permanent damage that will blemish this poor plant forever, you know, for the, the term of these leaves. And these leaves don't fall off and regenerate with new foliage every year like our leafy plants do, but this plant's going to be stuck with that. Um, hopefully it's just going to be cosmetic damage. In certain situations, it could develop into something um, more of a risk to the plant. Here is the elephant's food. It was hit by a, a really hard freeze, and you can see there was some dieback of some stem tissue, and a lot of the leaves are, are gone. Um, but you wanna make sure like with our leafy plants, if this does occur, leave that in place until danger of frost has passed at the end of the, the winter so that you won't be cutting this off and exposing more tissue below that to freeze damage. And you can certainly use um, frost cloth to protect your plants uh, or if you don't have that, old sheets um, if needed. For columnars, you can use styrofoam cups. Hopefully these will be going by you know, going away. So whenever you do receive a beverage in a styrofoam cup these days, I say, you know, take it home, wash it out and store it to use for your columnar cacti. The growth point is the most tender, most susceptible to freeze damage. Just by covering that, you can secure the, the health of your columnar cactus. Or if your agave is starting to bolt, and send up its bloom stalk. That isn't as cold hardy as the 
rest of the plant so you could protect it. When we have high nighttime temperatures, some of these succulents will fail. Um, they are not accustomed to functioning when these temperatures at night remain so high, especially for more than just one or two nights. It might look like the plant has rotted. Actually, the failure was caused by the lack of photosynthesis. They weren't able to open their pores at night to take in the oxygen, um, the carbon dioxide that would be needed, um, you know, stored and then utilized the next day when the sun comes out. And they just, they can't, can't continue to survive after several nights of that happening. So a lot of the echeverias and uh, you know, plants that are related to the jade, such as this um, cotyledon, um, they, they don't care much for high nighttime temperatures. Watering, make sure that you have an appropriate system with your desert um, irrigation system. You could maybe piggyback some of your succulents with a desert shrub line or some of your trees, you could utilize that to accommodate watering schedules for some of your cacti. Uh, but just make sure that you're, um, you know, not giving them too frequent a watering if you are using a drip irrigation system. And agave such as this, if it goes for too long of a time without sufficient moisture, it's going to start using up its reserves. And you can see it's the leaves have even changed orientation here. They become more vertical so that being less horizontal, they won't have sun as much sun hitting them directly. Once this were to receive a, a good watering around the root system here, it could revert back if you don't let it go for too long. With our prickly pears, here's a good example. Nice plump, it's you know had sufficient moisture that it's absorbed and stored in its system. When you start to see this, it's kind of like looking emaciated, um, that's a signal. Or if you start to see wrinkling, instead of the, the head-on view of the pad, instead of it being all nice smooth surfaced here, you know that it is using up its reserves of moisture and you need to um, get some more water into the soil. If you are using plants and those pesky little strips that, you know, the architect put right next to the house and then they tell you don't keep the soil moist next to your house, it'll encourage termite damage, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> if you do need to plant something, choose some nice drought tolerant succulents. They don't need consistently moist soil and that would be much better than um, a bunch of fufu annuals that would need the soil consistently moist. If you are, um, installing, especially a nice big specimen, cactus, or even some of your, your succulents, make sure you have invested in um, this plant. Make sure you have the orientation correct. Hopefully the nursery that you purchased it from would have it marked indicating um, the orientation in relation to the sun. Unfortunately, these silly nurseries um, they all have their different systems. Some mark them with, you know, some mark on the pot or whatever, you know, facing south. Others have it marked facing north or west. Um, but wherever you purchase your plants, make sure you understand their system of marking it so you can orient it correctly in your landscape. If not, if what was originally facing east is all of a sudden facing west, that is very different sun exposure, and it could cause some severe burn to that tissue, which um, like that freeze damage, it would be permanent. Also maintain the proper soil line when you're planting. Um, this prickly pear, it was planted higher than the um, existing soil line, but it wouldn't be bad if you were to be putting down a good inch or two inch layer of um, mulch around the landscape, that could be actually perfect for this plant. Never bury 
the stems of your saguaros or any of these other um, columnars to hold them upright. You need to brace them, but never bury them to keep them upright. It will be maybe five or probably more like 10 years down the line when you will see the horrible outcome of burying them when they start to rot and fall over. So with our saguaros, you should see a taper at the base if it's properly maintaining its original soil line as it was originally growing. Um, if it looks like a telephone pole, it's planted too deep. I always recommend that you remove the soil from your plants that you purchase at the nursery. And it's what we refer to as bare rooting. Shake off that soil, set them out of direct sun. So find um, a lightly shaded or moderately shaded place. Just let them lay there for a few days or even a week. This allows those thick fleshy roots that you see here, it allows them to heal and callus. That way when you plant them in the ground, they will not be as prone to having um, the roots just decay and rot if there is any injury to them. This is ideal because when you put these in the ground now, totally surrounding the root system, they will have a homogenous soil. When we purchase our succulents from the nursery, sometimes they're, the, well, usually the soil is very different from what we have in the ground in our yards. So having that homogenous soil that the roots will develop through is ideal. Also, these seem like, you know, they're well-armed plants with spines and thorns on the leaves and so forth, um, but there are beasts that do feed upon them. So if you have rabbits or javelina in the area, make sure that your plants are well protected. So now I'm just going to run through a very limited variety of cacti and succulents that you might consider to use in your landscape. You might have the need for a smaller scale plant or a larger one, plants for the shade or plants for full sun. So I'm hoping I'm giving you a, a good variety that you should be able to find different plants to include in different areas of your garden. There are, oh, one important thing. I recommend that when you're nursery shopping, that you take the botanical name with you. That way you can compare it to the label on the plant to help better ensure that you're getting the plant that you're actually interested in. Sometimes plants can look pretty similar, but they're not the same. Having that botanical name can help you uh, avoid um, getting home with the, the wrong plant. So with the hedgehog, cacti. They're pretty compact. They do get um, wider as years pass in, by growing new stems regularly, but overall they stay about a foot, foot and a half in height. They can take full sun to light shade and they just have the most gorgeous magenta colored flowers in the spring. Um, just absolutely lovely. If these flowers get pollinated, you will have fruits develop then. And it's always like, mm, do I eat that fruit or do I leave it for the wildlife? Um, there's always that dilemma, at least for me. I love to eat. Um, but there, there can be you know, so many attributes to these plants that will also accommodate wildlife. Um, similar looking, it is a relative, um, the claret cup. These can range in flower color from kind of a medium, um, almost um, pastel orange to deep orange to almost red color. They're kind of fun um, to have. Again, it's a nice small scale cactus that you can tuck in here and there. They do well in full sun to light shade also. The Argentine giant can get Big fat stems, individual stems that develop can eventually you know, reach three, four feet in length. 
So you can have a mature specimen that's, you know, a good six to eight feet wide sometimes. These are night bloomers. During the warm season, they will pop these fabulous buds that um, create, you know, large trumpet shaped flowers that open at night. They will wither when the sun really hits them the next day. Each flower only lasts for one night but you can have several bloom cycles during the period of a summer. They can grow in full sun or light shade. The Echinopsis, this is a group of cacti from South America. These, especially there are some really fun, um, smaller scale plants that are perfect for light to moderate shade under a Palo Verde or a mesquite. Um, they don't wanna be out in full sun. And also there are huge columnar specimens. So um, this group of plants, it really is varied in its growth form. But these smaller ones that do like some shade, they can just produce huge bouquets of lovely trumpet shaped flowers, ranging from white through pastels to even some hybrids. And um, some, some plant taxonomists group these as trichocereus, some are still using Echinopsis, so there could be a little variability, um, but there are hybrids available that are definitely showstoppers with their fantastic, um, almost surreal colors that um, are available. So, you know, who wants to care for roses? I'm, well, I'm lazy, lazy gardener. I would much rather have this beauty in my yard with these brilliant flowers than having to care for roses to get this beautiful color. Um, so now getting even a little smaller, there is um, this little ladyfinger cactus. It does need some shade here in the valley. The stems are maybe about an inch or so thick and it just kind of you know travels along the ground, ground hugging, ground cover type cactus starting around mid or late spring, uh, probably late spring on through the summer, you could have cycles of these brilliant flowers develop. Um, absolutely gorgeous. Just so nice to have this kind of peeking out from maybe under a um, Palo Verde tree canopy. A native mammillaria. Um, this is a group, a rather large group of plants. They all develop their flowers in rings um, that will then you'll get new buds develop a little farther in and so forth. So something like this pincushion, fishhook pincushion, it could have a few cycles of bloom and fruit production if it gets pollinated through the summer months. Um, it's another one. Right down here in the valley, I'd say you would want to give it some filtered sunlight or morning sun and afternoon shade, a little bit higher elevation. Um, it could go in full sun. Here are some more mammillarias. Some of them are solitary stems, but many will form um, just beautiful clumps or mounds. You can see some various forms here um, scattered in this display of the Desert Botanical Garden. You can see here that ring of flowers. They can vary depending on the species, vary in color. Some are, are very, very tiny, others a um, little bit larger, more prominent. Um, so just a fun group of plants if you've got a little bit of shade. The pine cone cactus, this is a really cool one. It's, it's fairly friendly. The um, doesn't have spines and the glaucids are actually inverted into the stem. The young developing stems really look like pine cones before they elongate and plump out a little bit. These can grow in full sun to light shade. So there's this form and also some others, whoops, some others that have some really wild spines on them. And these do have glockids and spines that are extruded from the stem. But this one, it's like thick, pa um, wide papery spines and these, they'll kind of twirl a little bit. Um, so some fun variations on this. They all produce these lovely kind of um, pale greenish white flowers in the summer. 
Astrophytum, this is a wonderful group of plants from Mexico that start out in a globular form and then elongate. They too here in the valley are better off with a little bit of midday shade or all day filtered sunlight. Um, they, they are slow growing, but eventually they can become more upright cylindrical forms. Um, some of them have no spines, such as this um, Muriel Stigma Bishop's cap, just gorgeous blooms, will usually open um, late morning or early afternoon. And others have spines all up and down those ribs. They might have markings. This one is totally covered with this almost, it's almost like a fleece um, like covering. Um, so it's not a disease. Looks a little bit like um, you know, a fungus or something, but that's just its natural patterning. Another one, nice one for some light shade is this Kleistocactus. It has spines, but it also has these hair-like um, bristly structures. The blooms are very narrow, elongated tubular forms, great for the hummingbirds. And these stems can get to be about three feet in height. And here is our native queen of the night with its just enchantingly fragrant plant uh, flowers that will occur usually late June to early July. The flowers are only open for one night. If they do get pollinated, they'll develop these fruits that the birds just relish. Um, so if you wanna get a taste, you gotta get in there and uh, fight off the birds. This is the one that develops that um, enlarging tub tuberous root system. Of course, our feral cacti, these are native to Mexico. I have always thought they, that it was kinder to plant them with a little bit of midday shade or um, you know, afternoon shade or filtered sunlight, uh, but many people do put them in full sun. I feel like this is getting um, more intense for these plants as the years go by. So I really do recommend that they do get a little bit of relief during the summer um, from that hottest midday or afternoon sun exposure. But they have this, these lovely yellow spines. So you've got some color from these plants year round. Native barrels, we do have those also. They start in a rounded globular form and elongate into a cylindrical form, such as the compass barrel. The flowers are lovely. They will start to appear in rings um, around early or midsummer. And you can have cycles through the summer followed by the fruit production. They are great in full sun as are the other native fish hook barrel. The flowers here can range from a yellowish orange to deep, deep, even reddish orange. You can see the end of the season um, after they've bloomed in, in cycles, you know, the circles, um, those rings through the summer. Um, by early winter, they can have a crown of fruit that have developed, adding still some more color to this plant through the cool season until somebody decides that they're hungry. Um, the fire barrel. Again, remember a lot of times with your cactus, when you have them, the spines backlit by the sun, they just um, become jewels in your garden. These spines provide color throughout the year and they really do appear to be on fire when they're backlit by the sun. The flowers are also very colorful. This is the horse crippler. It has some menacing spines that, uh, that it develops, but oh, so delicate and lovely are the flowers. It will bloom usually early summer. The fruit that develop are spineless actually, um, and they can be pretty tasty. Now, our prickly pears can range from low growing, such as the beaver tail prickly pear, you do have to be very, very uh, aware of the drainage of the soil. I would say that this beaver tail prickly pear 
is the most demanding of a well-draining soil of all the prickly pears that we typically use in our landscapes around here. So if it doesn't have um, sufficient drainage, it could rot very, very easily. They are so gorgeous in the spring with these just remarkable blooms. And, and their pads are shaped like a beaver tail, the kind of bluish green coloration, which I think is very interesting. So you have that range from very short to tree form with our prickly pears and about everything in between in size and, and form. This tree-like form is unique in that it has very few, if any, spines. So it's another one that can be fairly friendly, but there are individual differences. So if you're gonna include one, you have children that you're worried about, then make sure you really give a good look to the plant that you're starting out with. And here, beautiful flowers followed by fruits eventually in the summer. This one I love. I just think these spines are so awesome. Um, this is the black spine prickly pear. Those spines can be three to even four inches in length. They kind of range in color as they elongate. Um, from almost like a tan to a black color. In the spring, these flowers are absolutely so colorful. They're brilliant with this scarlet red and uh, golden yellow. Got that bicolor and then combine that with the kind of purplish color of the pads. It is absolutely wonderful. And they just go so beautifully with a range of our leafy desert plants. Now, don't be deceived by the name, bunny ears. It is one of those cacti, it does not have any spines, but it is loaded with glaucids. You definitely wanna handle these very carefully, um, be well covered. You don't wanna get these glaucids in your skin. You will be um, just miserable for a long time and, until you can get those out. The um, glockids, they range, you can get some variations of these. They might have white glockids or yellow or kind of a golden or rusty color um, glockid, but they all have these gorgeous, very um, delicate looking yellow flowers that will kind of fade as they're withering to a pretty peach or pink color. This is another one that's fairly low growing, not as low as the beaver tail, but it usually doesn't get more than about two feet in height. Over the years though, it can spread. You could print it back um, if you don't want it to spread too much, but it could actually be used as a, a very wonderful ground cover. Um, once you get it established, you can let it go and spread. And here you can see the, that rusty color um, glacket there. The purple prickly pear. Absolutely gorgeous year round. It has more pronounced color in response to the cool temperatures. So during the winter, it, more purple will be um, visible and the new pads that develop into the winter, into the spring will be just a deep purple color. The flowers, again, that wonderful combination of the yellow with the purple and bluish um, hues of the pads. With the purple prickly pear, the spination can vary. You might not really have any spines or there might be loads of spines that are maybe half an inch to an inch in length. So there is some variability there. Okay, we have the bunny ears and then the teddy bears. These are both lethal. <laughs> you, know, you don't wanna hug or mess with either one of these. The choya is, a little bit varied, it might have one main stem and then branch um, profusely from that one main stem, or the whole plant might just really start branching profusely right from the base. Um, so a little bit slightly different growth habit can be found amongst these. The flowers are a ve very delicate kind of cream um, color with a little blush of pink there. So they're not very showy, but very delicate looking. Again, in contrast to those just beastly spines. The saguaro, you know, our signature plant of the Sonoran Desert. 
These will bloom in the spring, usually around April. The flowers are white. They, the flowers generally open at night and then they're open for, through most of the next day, but then they'll, they'll start to, to wither. So you can get night pollinators as well as bees and a lot of birds the next morning still have a lot of nectar available to them. After pollination, we have the ripening fruits around June or July. So, um, you know, sometimes people get confused. The, the fruits are red, the flowers are white. When birds make nesting holes in these, it's best to just let them do that. Um, we have two native birds, the Gila woodpecker and the flicker that can, that are equipped with the perfect nest building, excavating bill and beak. And generally they do not harm the plant. It is rare that their excavating technique would allow for bacterial infection. It does happen sometimes, but very rarely. More often what can be more injurious um, or you know, more of a risk for having a bacterial infection are the things that people do to combat <laughs> the development or the use of those cavities. Um, I've seen people stuff really strange things into these cavities to try to keep the birds out. And usually that will trap moisture there that's more likely to cause the bacterial infection. Um, so birds, you know, and I've heard people, well, you know, I covered up the hole on the one side and the bird went to the other side. Um, it's just their natural association with this plant. So overall, if they start nesting, enjoy it. Um, observe that nature in your, your landscape. Now, this is a, another South American cactus that has these night blooms, that elongated big trumpet shaped form, nice light floral scent, sweet scent associated with these. If they get pollinated, you can get some good fruits that are um, about baseball size even develop on these plants. And there are a few different, um, what we would call monstrose forms. Um, they too can provide those lovely blooms. So this compared to our saguaro with its origin, I would say this needs a little bit more frequent watering than our saguaro, um, but they're still very, very drought tolerant. And here's one of my favorites. I love the fruits on this garambullo. See, common names can be just as tricky as, you know, Mertillo cactus. Uh, this is a cactus you can find down in Mexico. The flowers are so fragrant. Um, they're kind of like a mix of jasmine and gardenia. They will open like late at night and in the morning your garden will be just um, in this mode of enchanting fragrance. It travels through the air. Once these flowers are pollinated, you'll get fruits about pea size. They have, to me, it tastes like a blueberry grape combination. Um, so this is just a lovely um, columnar cactus. And the, the spines aren't too wicked on this plant either. There are monstrous forms. I've not seen these bloom. Um, but here, you know, this one has the buds, flower buds on it. I've never actually got, gotten to witness one, but I would imagine they are just as sweetly fragranced as the regular, the basic plant. The Mexican fence post has this just wonderful sculptural upright form. The flowers that appear on those ribs, those margins where the aerials are, they can range from a kind of a pale greenish white to this deep pink color. They're generally very narrow, tubular, great for the hummingbirds. And these can grow in full sun to light shade. The totem pole is a great one if you don't want spines, um, you know, if you've got children or pets, these are a great selection for your garden. They are, um, it's just a natural variation of our Sunita cactus. The organ pipe has those wonderful um, columnar forms that it's a little bit more kind of um, rounded than the Mexican fence post, 
Flowers are gorgeous. They will open in the evening. They will develop into fruits that's about golf ball size. So those got a nice range of cactus there and some succulents. Agaves are what we refer to as monocarpic. They bloom once and die, poor things, uh, but they do go out with a big hurrah. This is a squid agave, so it's a nice, friendly agave. It doesn't have nasty teeth on the leaf margins or um, dagger-like leaf tips. I do recommend a little bit of shade for this one midday or afternoon during the summer. This is the other friendly one, the smooth-leafed agave. We can find these in an all green form or a variegated form with kind of a medium or pale yellow margin um, on those leaves. And they will bloom um, usually within about, oh, five to seven years uh, of developing. So they mature very rapidly. Some other agaves might not mature um, for 30 years or so. Here is the twin flowered agave. It's another fairly friendly one. The leaves have this nice kind of thread like filament that comes off of the margins. And when it blooms, it has two flowers coming out of an individual point, hence that common name twin flowered agave. And it just sends up this spike like bloom stalk that um, can get to be, oh, good 15 or perhaps 20 feet in length. A lot of times when it's blooming, um, kind of the stress and down turn of the plant, you'll have these maroon colored leaves. Black spined agave, this is one that pups a lot. So some like the twin flowered will remain a solitary plant throughout its life. Others will de develop pups or clones. So be aware of this because, you know, some people don't want these clumps forming. I just think this is so wild. Um, dark, dark, dark maroon, almost black colored spines on these, these leaf tips. I think it's so gorgeous contrasting with the silvery color of the leaves. Um, a, a very popular one, it's very sculptural, is the artichoke agave. It has these little kind of cur curves to the um, leaf tips there. And the Queen Victoria, very regal. This is kind of a nice small to medium size agave that um, can go in full sun or light shade. Now, one more friendly agave is the octopus agave. It gets quite a bit larger than the squid, just as with squid and octopi. Um, it too develops these spike-like blooms. It's another one to, that rapidly matures about five to seven years and then it sends up this bloom stalk. So this is a spectacle that once these blooms finish, every single one of those agaves will die. Um, you can plan to replace them, but just be aware of that. And with something like this, they, they're um, grown by the nurseries by clones, um, the bulbils that come off of those bloom stems. So they will typically all bloom at the same time, which can just be um, a showstopper. The, the spectacularness of it is um, just something to see. It's spectacular if you have one, but if you have several, it's just really special. The agave blue glow is a medium-sized agave. It can grow in full sun to light shade, and this is gorgeous, but at the time of day when the sun is, is backlighting, the leaves, that's where you really get the glow part of its name. You'll have that yellow and red on the margin that just comes to life. It, it literally lights up when that sun is behind the plant. We have a range of aloes. Some of them will remain individuals. Others will clump like crazy. So be aware of that. And some, most of them like a little bit of midday or afternoon shade during the summer here. Um, just a few of them can, can thrive in full sun, but they all have, most of them have a cool season bloom. Um, here's this Dawes aloe, deep, deep pinkish red blooms um, around January, right on through to about March or so. 
And this is an aloe that has color throughout the year. It gets to be a little bit more pronounced during the winter. Nice small scale clumping. And of course our, our aloe vera, it's a, kind of a spring bloomer, usually around March, they pop into bloom. And all of these are wonderful for hummingbirds with those tubular flowers that they produce. Blue elf is a really versatile, can grow in full sun to light shade, and it has a long bloom, um, usually around February through April or so. Now, oops, here's um, a tree form aloe, the quiver tree. It does remain as an individual form. And very popular now is this aloe Hercules. It's a hybrid. Um, one of the parents is this quiver tree. It has these really large, um, robust, long leaves. It is quite rapid growing, whereas the quiver tree is slow to develop. Um, so this might be something you'd be interested in if you want this um, just wonderful, big um, focal point in your landscape. <clears throat> Some of the ice plants, here is this um, kind of magenta blooming in the spring. And this one, you can see how these plants get this name. It looks like there's little ice crystals um, formed on the leaf surface. So this is one, one big bloom in the spring. I love this red ice plant because it has um, just spots of color through almost the entire year. Uh, can range from this kind of coppery orange to coppery red color. And the um, yellow ice plant, or some people call it Rocky Point ice plant, um, primarily um, an early season spring um, bloomer. Ponytail palms, they have this um, unique enlarged base that we call, call a caudex. They can, they're pretty adaptable to full sun or light shade. And these bulbinies, great kind of smaller scale, succulent plant that has, has a long bloom from October, usually till April, the next spring, with these um, very delicate kind of star-shaped blossoms. This plant is available with the all yellow flowers or the yellow and orange. And this, this, plants like this are nice. You can tuck them here and there because of their smaller scale. Tough as nails, is the um, Euphorbia antisyphilitica, the candelia, that is, I think, best in full sun. It, it keeps the stems more upright and, and really dense and compact. Flowers look like little candy. To me, they look like little cake candies. Um, they start out kind of a, a cream and pink, and the pink increases as those flowers um, kind of develop and start to fade. Here we have the slipper plant with big leaves. Now, when I first met this plant, I thought for sure it had to have some shade. It will actually thrive in full sun or light shade. So it keeps these big leaves year round, whereas its relative has some very, very small leaves for just a brief period as the new stems develop. And then that's it. So most of the year, it's just the new stems. But both of them have just the wildest flowers that have this unique shape. They will be visited by hummingbirds also. Here's another euphorbia, really thick stout stems that over the years will just form this nice dense mound. It's best with full sun. If you've got it in you know, some shade, partial shade, usually those stems get kind of scraggly and elongated. This is the pencil plant. And I do want to caution you, euphorbias can exude a milky sap that can be a skin irritant. Some plants, it will be a stronger irritant. And for some people, you'll be more effective than others. So just always be careful, um, you know, wear long sleeves and gloves and protective eye gear when you're working with euphorbias. Um, this is one that can grow to actually a small tree form here. It has a very popular, now very popular um, form that has intense 
orange to red color during the winter months in response to the, the cold stress. Now, smaller scale again, these are Manfredas. I love these because they're funky. They have splotches on the leaves that I just think are fun. But there are different species available. Generally, they will um, form clumps over time and their flowers will appear in the spring or early summer. Um, they're very delicate looking and they will provide a lot of nectar for hummingbirds. Elephant food, you can plant it anywhere. It, it, it loves full sun to light or even moderate shade. There are some variegated forms available though. With those, I would stick more to a little bit of shade during the summer. Now the sunset areas, um, mothers-in-law's tongue or snake plants, there are different species and loads of hybrids and cultivars available these days. Even during the winter, I would say do not expose these to direct sun. They need to be in shade. They will produce blooms that are just wildly fragrant. Um, some of the fragrance um, will vary, but generally they have very, very sweet smelling flowers. This is one of my favorites, the, the um, cylindrical leaf form, and it smells like sweet coconut when it's in bloom. So you can for, find forms that are very small in stature, can be a nice little ground cover to those that have big beefy leaves or round leaves, um, blooms that vary. This is very attractive, kind of a pink and cream color flower. So these can be a lot of fun and you have a nice variety available for those shaded areas. Okay, who likes to play tricks on your friends? Starfish flowers. Now they vary, some of them it's not so pronounced, but others really stink. So I'm the evil friend who, if you're not familiar with this plant and you come to visit and one's blooming, I'd say, yeah, take a whiff. They're primarily pollinated by flies. So to attract the flies, they smell like rotting meat, carrion. Um, in addition to starfish flowers, some people call them carrion flowers, but there, there's a, a wide range of species and relatives of these stapelias that can be really fascinating. This is another group of plants that you could use in lightly shaded areas. And a lot of these can even just be wonderful container plants also. Even the flower buds on this are cool. And yuccas. Yuccas, we have um, shorter clumping forms of yuccas. They will grow usually a little bit faster than the tree-like forms. Uh, but here's a great one, it's native to our region here, the banana yucca. It actually does produce a fruit that has a fleshy um, tissue. Most of the yuccas produce a fruit that's a dry capsule. Um, so this is a lower growing clumping form. And here the soap tree yucca will gradually, slowly grow to this tree form. And it will shoot up a stalk with the blooms way way high up. This is a nice young, younger version that you could actually see those blooms a little bit more closely. Um, and the pale leaf yucca, this is another shorter clumping form that doesn't get more than about three foot tall individual plants and those bloom stalks, usually about six to eight feet in height. This is another one that has a nice little margin on the leaf that's comes into real color when the sun's behind it. And our beaked yucca. This is one that slowly develops into a tree form. The flowers, um, very typical of these yuccas is the cream or greenish cream or um, sometimes a pinkish green, but more, more often just a, a cream color flower on our yuccas. Most of them will bloom kind of late spring into early summer, somewhere around April to May or June. So this one does branch, but it usually branches um, pretty high up. It's um, kind of similar looking um, is the yucca rigida. That one tends to branch a little bit lower down. 
So those are some examples of some absolutely wonderful succulents, both um, cacti and other succulents that you could include in your desert garden. And as mentioned before, you have this publication available. It is also available on the amwa.org website. The great thing about this is you get many more photos of individual plants that are featured. There is also a search function. You can enter all kinds of criteria to narrow down your plant option list. So I do encourage you to investigate this at the amwa.org website um, to really help you um, get a better idea of these 200 low water use plants that we have available for us to use in our gardens here. So I thank you and do we have questions now? Thank you so much, Kirti. That was a spectacular presentation. It's so amazing that there's so many different plants that are suitable for Arizona and they're so captivating and beautiful and colorful. So thank you for sharing the variety that sure. we're here in the desert. That and I think, do you, do you have something you wanna pop back up on the screen now? Oh, no, it's okay. I don't have anything to pop back on now. Um, oh, well then, <laughs> then we'll, we'll leave it with this. <laughs> Did we have questions? We do. We do have a lot of questions. We had a great, great uh, questions being added in the chat. Um, and so one of some of the questions that came through, we'll start with one of them, is are succulents such as, and I'm probably going to pronounce all these wrong, Extraviras, Crisula, Anomiums, and Colanche able to grow in the desert? And are there require, watering requirements the same as cacti? They will need more frequent watering, um, certainly than a lot of our native cacti. Um, and I, I had mentioned, you know, I showed you that example of that cotyledon succulent. I would classify definitely the Echeverias in that same group of they are struggling here during the summer now that we tend to have um, more numerous nights where we don't get below. 90 degrees. Um, that's very difficult for them. So I'm, some of these I'm even um, kind of recommending to people that, hey, you know, maybe plant it in the fall and consider it an annual. And if it doesn't make it through the, you know, through the summer, you know, don't be heartbroken. Um, if you do, if you want to grow things like that, it might be better to keep them in a nice, good size, nice, large container that you might be able to um, move it to, you know, a little cooler microclimate during the summer months. Uh, make sure that it gets some shade and would be a little cooler. Um, that's one way, but sometimes you just can't keep those alive. Um, so, you know, the relatives, what we would consider the crashlas, like the jade plants and their relatives, um, they can really struggle. Um, during during the summer months, but they would need more frequent watering than um, a lot of your cactus plants. But they're they're still drought tolerant plants, but um, they can't go for as long of a stretch as some of the cacti can. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's good to just, sometimes you just got to do trial and error and see what works and what doesn't. So thank you for that. Option. That can be a very heartbreaking part of gardening, but it can also be an exciting part of gardening, the trial and error. Yeah, because you're always going to learn something new. Another question that came in is, is there a certain or is there a way to contain cacti to keep them from taking over a yard? And then also should cacti be pruned? This will definitely depend on the type of cacti. Some of them are, you know, don't spread much, if at all. Um, so others do. If you're working with prickly pears, for instance, and it's getting maybe a little bit larger, taking up a little bit more space than you would, would like, you could do some pruning. I would suggest that for aesthetics, and also for the um, ease of that plant being able to heal, um, to callus where you cut. Um, with the prickly pears, try to cut right between two pads. That's a smaller wound that will be made on the plant. 
and it will callus and heal more rapidly and look nicer. If you're pruning columnars, if you can't take a, a stem all the way back to the base, again, you know, for aesthetics so that you don't have, you know, that cut right across a stem, um, then maybe try to angle the cut. So from the outside, that would be the high point of your cut and angle it a little bit um, towards the center of the plant, you know, the down cut. So then it's a little less visible, a little less noticeable. But on a columnar stem, when you do cut it, that usually will trigger more branching. So think very carefully. If you're feeling like it's getting too big, taking up too much space, um, you would most likely want to cut that stem all the way back to the ground so that higher up you don't have more, more stems, more branches developing. Good to know, yeah, <laughs> because some people might have been, like you said, it might have made it worse. So that's so awesome to note that, that it really depends on the, the plant type. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I, I don't know if there's, you know, some kind of a, a plant in particular, but um, they're not really succulents, but just as an example, the, um, the red yuccas, which aren't really yuccas that we see used so commonly around the valley, they're just really great tough plants and they have a long bloom. The hummingbirds love those flowers. Um, don't, don't cut those leaves. If it's getting too big, um, you, could, you could actually you know, get a shovel down in and kind of slice right down and remove an outer portion of the plant. Best would be as if you pop the whole plant out of the ground and divide it and plant part of it back into the ground. Um, but don't you know, start cutting the leaves or shaving the sides of the plant because those leaves are gonna dry up where you've cut and, and look bad and just not the right approach to the care of those plants. If you're working with aloes, or agaves that are pupping and they're getting a little out of their bounds, um, then gently excavate around the perimeter and, and pull, um, excavate a little bit of the soil away. And then you can pull, it's almost like an umbilical cord. Um, you can pull the stem that originates at the parent and then connects to the pup. Um, you can just pull that and you can pot that up and give it to a friend or plant it someplace else in the yard. Um, but that's, it takes a little bit of time, but that's um, the best approach when you're working with the agaves or aloes that have made too many pups around the, the parent plant. I love that idea too, like sharing with your friends or your neighbors or putting it somewhere else in the yard. That's such a great way to, to make yeah. maybe like a little plant swap or something. <laughs> yep. Or I, I see a lot of time on next door where people say, you know, free aloes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great way to know our neighbors too. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question related to aloes is my aloe vera tips are dry and they curl and can snap off to groom the plant. Is that due to too much water or not enough? Uh now, I don't know, but I would guess that this aloe is in too much direct sun um, and that would cause the leaf tips of the aloe to dry out. If, if your agave leaf or your aloe leaf, um, if the tips dry up and you wanna trim that off, always, cut off the dried up right up to the green living tissue, but don't cut into the green living tissue. Um, that's a new wound that's gonna have to heal and then that's gonna dry up. So, you know, take some good sharp clippers. They need to be very, very sharp um, and just clip right along the dried up dead tissue, but not into the good living green tissue. Got it, that makes sense. Like you said, so that way you're getting rid of the you know, um, damaged piece, but that way it can, you know, you can still preserve the piece that's healthy and pre prevent yes. that from traveling up the plant. Yeah. Another question, we have a lot of great questions. Thank you guys for submitting these. Um, another question is, do yuccas die after blooming like agave? No, only the agaves are monocarpic. So an agave will start, it will grow, 
when it gets to its mature size, then it blooms and that's it. So for some of them, it only takes five or seven years to mature. Others, it takes 30 or 40 years. I don't know of any that it actually takes 100 years, but way back when, um, somebody probably felt like it took 100 years. And I think that's how they got that name century plant. Um, but yes, the ones that do produce pups around them though, those pups remain. They will continue to grow. It's just the original parent plant that sent up that bloom stalk that will die. And for those that develop what we call bulbils, they're little plantlets. They are actually clones of the parent, just like a pup you know, around the base would be a clone of the parent. Um, for the um, smooth leaf agave or the um, octopus agave, they develop bulbils on their bloom stalks. You can twist those little plantlets off and plant them and have new plants. Even though they mature and bloom and die in a very short period of time, just save a few of those bulbils and you've got your new new cycle of agaves to, to replant. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. That's so cool. But your, your yuccas, most of the yuccas have to get to a fairly mature um, size or age before they bloom. After that, um, they do not die. They, some might bloom every year following that, and others it might be kind of sporadic, maybe every few years, but they won't die. Um, so we have the Hesperallos, which um, their, you know, their common name is red yucca. They're not yuccas, but um, those are plants. They bloom and don't die. Um, the yuccas bloom and don't die. We have some others such as bear grass, the, the nolinas. Um, they bloom and they don't die. So it's pretty much just those agaves. Now, the Manfredas that I, show, that I showed, um, I think what happens with those is they bloom and it might take a couple of years, um, but that original plant that bloomed will die off, but it's not as evident as with the agaves. Um, but, but pretty much just those agaves are the ones that, um, you know, it's their last hurrah, they put on a good show and then life is over. Yeah, that photo you had was amazing. I love seeing the line of the agave bloom. That was beautiful. Another question we had is for night bloomers, do bats pollinate them often or are they pollinated by butterflies, et cetera, the next morning in daylight? For our night blooming cacti, they are primarily pollinated depending on the region. Um, they might be primarily pollinated by bats um, some of them are pollinated by um, moths. Many of those night blooming cacti are, the flowers are open the next morning, um, where if they didn't get the night pollinators, some birds or um, bees might affect pollination. Um, so um, the yuccas, they're pretty specific, um, pollinated by a um, there are just, I think, so two, maybe two or three species of moth are the, the pollinators for the yuccas. Um, but, but yeah, the, those night bloomers, they, are, they could be pollinated by um, non-diurnal creatures the following morning. That's awesome. I'm learning so many new things for tonight's class. Um, do you recommend any fertilizing of cacti or succulents? I would say very infrequent. Um, maybe one fertilizer application at the start of the growing season for that particular um, succulent plant, that would probably suffice. If you're growing things in containers, of course, you're watering more frequently, the soil dries out more rapidly, and you might apply a few um, cycles of fertilizer, but my preference um, for any plants, but definitely for the, the succulent plants is to use an organic because it has a low concentration generally of nitrogen. Um, so you're not like forcing a big burst of vegetative growth 
which I think is, is not the best. I, I do have friends um, in the Cactus and Succulent Society that use the synthetic fertilizers, but they always use like quarter strength or half strength at most um, when they're using those synthetics because it has such a high concentration of nitrogen. Thank you, Cardi. You have so much experience and expertise, so I'm so glad that you're here to help answer all these questions. Um, I'm going to start scanning through since I know we only have about five minutes left. So if your question doesn't get answered, be sure to send us an email and we'll try to get you connected with some resources and some um, advice to help you with your gardening. Um, one question we had is, what nurseries do you suggest have a good variety of native cacti and succulents to purchase? Um, oh boy, with natives, especially I would say look to some of our uh, more local nurseries or just for a good, really good range of succulents overall, native and non-native, I would suggest our local nurseries and to really get probably a wider range of the natives, I would say um, you're probably better off hitting the botanical institutions uh, like the Desert Botanical Garden, Boyce Thompson Arboretum, um, some of our botanical institutions in Tucson, they will have regular plant sales where you can usually get a wider variety of the, the really cool plants. And for, for natives overall, um, well, I guess that I was gonna mention a retail nursery in Apache Junction, but I think they, they recently closed. Um, they just have their wholesale nurseries um, still going. But I, yeah, I check around to with the you know local nurseries more so than the big box. I think you find a, a nicer selection. Yeah, I like that we're supporting our yeah local nurseries and well that too yeah <laughs> yeah support our local businesses. Um, another question that we had is why is Indian fig so prone to the fluffy white stuff? Oh, the cochineal scale. Well. That's not the only prickly pear. Um, and sometimes choyas will get an infestation of that cochineal scale. It's a, a sucking insect that has a coating. Um, it's wax-like. Wax it's just a protection, protective coating. And they are hidden under that fluffy, cottony looking coating. And they're, they're sucking from the tissues of the, the cactus you can just hose them off. I would say that's the most effective approach to control them. And they're gonna come back sometimes, um, hose them off again. You know, a nice, a, a forceful enough flow of water to knock them off. If you were to use a chemical treatment, they'd probably be back again anyway. So I'd say safer for you and for the environment overall, get the hose out. Um, a little bit of infestation is okay, but when it starts getting, you know, that the population's growing, then you definitely need to, to um, you know, knock that population back. Um, but they, they, do, they do have their favorites. Uh, I'm not sure what causes one prickly pear to be more favored than another, but it's just, you know, keeping an eye on your plants um, and, and Posing them off when, when you do see the population start to pop up again. Okay, one final question. And again, if you didn't get your question answered tonight, feel free to reach out to us um, with your question again. We'll be sure to you know, put you in touch with resources and give you advice. Um, this one's for you know container gardening enthusiasts. So um, someone said, I have a, um, some four inch small potted cacti that grow a lot but the pots are small. How do I know when to repot? I'm afraid they'll tip over. Um, you, you pretty much follow the cues that you would for leafy plants. Overall, you want the size of the plant to be pretty much in, in pretty good proportion to the size of the container. And I would say if you have a ponytail palm and it's a, you know, it needs to be repotted. Something like that would tell you, it'll just break the pot. So anyway, I'm sorry. Um, I, I just think that's, so I've, I've seen a ponytail palm break a, a um, brick retaining wall when, when it didn't have enough room left. 
Um, but, but just try to keep an eye on just aesthetically the proportion. And that can oftentimes be a really good guide. Um, and, but if it's been in the container for a really long time, hasn't really grown much, but it's starting to look maybe not as vigorous, then that could be a, a good indication that the roots have just kind of overtaken the container. Um, there's not much soil left to support holding moisture and, and whatnot. And you can always just kind of, um, you know, tip your pot over gently and, and kind of loosen and pull out the, the root ball to see also. Yay, I love that. It's a great tip, a lot of great information. And just for the sake of time, um, we're gonna end it here with questions. But once again, if you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. We definitely wanna connect you with resources and advice to make sure your gardening is a success. And Kurti, thank you again for such a spectacular presentation. So much good information. I know all of our attendees and myself included have left feeling inspired of all the great plant palettes that you've shown us tonight. Um, a reminder, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. I'll send a follow-up email with the PowerPoint resources recording and a link to the survey. Again, if you fill out the survey, you'll be entered in to win a gift card to a local nursery. So you can already start indulging on some cacti and succulents for your yard. Um, remember, if you complete the survey by Monday, you'll be entered to win that free gift card. Um, this class definitely wrapped up our Spring Green Living series, and we hope you'll stay tuned for our summer and fall classes. So definitely subscribe to our newsletter to keep in touch. I'll include that information in the follow-up email. And once again, have a great night, everyone, and take care. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you.